My name is Sue Dykema. I'm the Executive Director for the Aesthetic Society. So we're excited to welcome you to this webinar tonight, which is the Patient Decision Aid Series. It is the first in this series. So it's cutting edge patient education and informed consent for primary breast augmentation. And tonight our presenter is Kelsey Hagopian, and we have two panelists um, working with us, uh, Dr. Lori Cassis and Dr. Mindy Haas. So before we get started, just a couple of announcements for everybody. Um, the ideas and concepts we're providing here are not um, legal advice. This is information that's accurate as of today. Uh, we did ask that everyone use the chat function tonight to input in there what you'd like to get out of this, what you're hoping to learn. That would be incredibly helpful to us, as well as throughout the session tonight, please put your questions in there as well. We'll be moderating that and making sure we get to all of your questions. This is being recorded and it will be posted online about 24 to 48 hours after, and we'll be sending an email to everyone who's signed up to make sure they're um, aware that they can record this or can watch, read this again at any time. We do wanna thank Allergan Aesthetics for their support of this program through an educational grant. Uh, they've been terrific partners with us. And I just, one last time, I do want to mention at the top of the chat is a link to the PDA document we're talking about tonight. It's available there as a PDF for you to download and use as desired. So with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Mindy Haas, who will be our moderator to kick us off tonight. Dr. Haas? Thanks, Sue. Hey, everybody. Patient decision aids. If you're like me, I didn't know anything about a patient decision aid up to about 18 months ago. But now I do. But it's taken a lot of teaching from Chelsea, and we're hoping to, to help you with that. We got interested in patient decision aids, Dr. Cassis, Dr. Adams, and myself after meeting Chelsea Agopian at the FDA hearings. This is the research and what Chelsea has worked to get her uh, doctor of nursing practice and health systems leadership in patient decision aids. Specifically, she's written the patient decision aid for breast augmentation. She is currently a clinical instructor at the Emory University Neil Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing. Um, she is presently participating in the 2020 class of the uh, Emory University Healthcare Ethics Leadership Academy through the Emory University Center for Ethics and Healthcare Ethics Consortium. She's practiced clinically in the field of plastic surgery as a nurse, a nurse practitioner for the last eight and five years, respectively. So her research focuses on ethics and informed consent. All that to be said, she is an expert, and I want to make sure we're clear on that. When we went to the FDA to talk about breast implants, one of the topics that was a interest to the FDA, as well as the patient advocates we met there, as well as all of us, is informed consent. For years, we've done traditional informed consent documents. The patient read through them, they check mark, they initial, they sign at the end. Well, it should come as a surprise to no one that those are outdated informed consent practices. And around the country, in other aspects of medicine, patient decision aids have come to the forefront. And this is a way to have joint informed education through a living, breathing document that will change and be updated year over year with new information so that not only can you do better informed consent for your patient, but they can come to your office better prepared for their consultation. I know all of us have patients come in with a lot of information from all different corners of the internet that we'd really rather them have, at least have in addition to that, the information we want them to have. This is a way to do that in one document. So to get started, we really want you to fill out a poll with just a couple of questions to kind of get an idea where everybody's at with their consent document and what they're using now. So if you could participate with me, how familiar are you with shared decision-making? And what consents are you currently using in your clinical practice? Okay. 
Okay, once everybody's filled this out, I think we want to start and let Chelsea get started and teach us about patient decision aids and why we need to get on the patient decision aid train. Thank you, Dr. Haas, and good evening, everyone. It is an honor and a pleasure to speak with you today. I would like to give my regards to both Dr. Lori Cassis and Dr. Melinda Haas for moderating this presentation, to Sue Dykema and the Aesthetic Society for organizing this webinar series and supporting this research, to members of the Aesthetic Society and others that may be listening, as well as to Allergan for supporting this webinar series through an education grant. I thank all of you for the opportunity to present to you today and look forward to some engaging discussion throughout the presentation. The focus of today's discussion is on a patient decision aid or PDA we have developed for use with adult females actively considering primary breast augmentation surgery with implants. The purpose of this PDA is to help make it easy to realistically and reliably integrate shared decision making in practice. A process of shared decision-making is where patients and plastic surgeons collaborate in weighing the risks, benefits, and burdens of clinically appropriate treatment options to make informed decisions based on the best available evidence, the surgeon's clinical experience and knowledge, and the patient's values and preferences. The nature of decisions about aesthetic plastic surgery procedures is inherently preference sensitive, meaning decisions involve more than one clinically appropriate option with no single empirically best option to address a patient's aesthetic concerns or achieve their aesthetic goals. What option is best must be guided by the relevant values and informed preferences of the patient. Further, the success of a procedure is measured by the patient's satisfaction with the result. Importantly, shared decision-making values the expertise of both the surgeon and patient, with the surgeon being the clinical expert and the patient being the expert of their own experiences. Meaningful input from both is necessary for quality decision-making and genuinely informed consent. Further, shared decision-making recognizes that decision-making and informed consent do not occur in a vacuum. Many people are involved in patient education and decision-making across multiple touch points, ultimately influencing the quality of decisions and how informed the patient's consent actually is. A novel feature of this PDA is that it is designed intentionally as a preferred alternative to traditional informed consent documents. Given that some form of a traditional informed consent document is universal, by upgrading it to an evidence-based patient decision aid, the PDA should seamlessly integrate into the usual clinic flow for informed consent while also helping to better prepare and support patients and surgeons when actively considering options and actually making decisions. The main point is that informed consent processes should be evidence-based, not arbitrary. Shared decision-making with use of patient decision aids applies an evidence-based approach to informed consent. I would also like to encourage you to download the PDA if you have not done so already. A link to the PDA was included in the registration materials for this webinar, or you can access it directly by simply navigating to the web address noted on the slide. Sue also placed a link uh, to the PDA in the chat and you should find it at the top. So this presentation will be divided into two short segments and each will be followed by an opportunity for questions. First, a brief review of some foundational content on patient decision aids, namely what a PDA is, the published standards for developing and evaluating the quality of PDAs, and how PDAs differ from traditional informed consent documents and checklists. Then I will introduce our newly developed PDA entitled Making Quality Decisions About Primary Breast Augmentation Surgery by highlighting a few key features of the PDA, the relevant research informing it, and further supporting evidence. Dr. Cassis will also share some insights from her early experiences with using the PDA in practice. So let's get started. Patient decision aids or PDAs are evidence-based tools that help patients meaningfully participate in decision-making about healthcare options. More than an educational pamphlet or website, there are three defining characteristics. A PDA, one, 
makes explicit the decision or decisions that need to be made, the options and their features. Two, helps patients to clarify and communicate their values and preferences. And three, empowers patients and clinicians to work together to make informed decisions based on the clinically appropriate options, the best available scientific evidence, and what matters most to patients. The active process of bilateral communication and collaboration requiring meaningful input from both the patient and the clinician is termed shared decision-making. In observing and listening to informed consent in practice, common expressions of consenting the patient or getting the patient's consent exclude the patient, whether it's done consciously or not. The traditional informed consent document is the symbol and central focus of the common practice of informed consent. It furthers this narrative of a passive unilateral formality focused on surgeon disclosure rather than patient understanding and engagement. Use of PDAs fundamentally changes the narrative to inform consent being an active bilateral process of shared decision-making done with the patient, rather than informed consent being a siloed transaction of obtaining a signature on a form done to the patient. Further issues with traditional informed consent documents include that they are lengthy, text-laden, content-oriented forms that parrot long lists of risks with no guidance for how to meaningfully organize this information or how the information applies to the patient's actual decision-making. The content is also highly variable in depth, breadth, and quality. These concerns are resolved with PDAs. The FDA recently published an updated guidance document for manufacturer-specific patient labeling for breast implants that includes a box warning and checklist. Similar to this, legislation has been proposed in Arizona to further require standardized checklists before breast implant procedures. What is concerning here is that by requiring a more detailed disclosure without considering the context and ethics of effective communication, it will likely only add to the burden of care. Furthermore, the decisions patients face and the associated risks, benefits, and burdens differ based on the specific indication for which the breast implants are being used, such as primary breast augmentation, breast reconstruction, revision augmentation or reconstruction, or male-to-female gender-affirming surgery. The belief that manufacturer-specific materials, such as the checklist and box warning, will promote a balanced discussion between patients and their surgeons about the benefits and risks of breast implants is erroneous. Consider the science of risk communication. Just as traditional informed consent documents do not assist patients in understanding how lists of information about risks, benefits, and burdens of a procedure actually apply to their decision-making, neither do checklists or box warnings. For example, a patient may understand that breast implants are not lifetime devices while still not appreciating that this means that they will likely need further surgery related to their breast implants in the future. Traditional informed consent documents, checklists, and box warnings do not assist patients in making this connection. However, we recognize the spirit of checklists and box warnings as a call for decreased variation in what information is disclosed to patients, as well as recognizing a need for easily identifiable essential information that should be discussed with all patients, as currently, the information a patient receives is dependent on the surgeon they see. As noted on the previous slide, these concerns are reconciled with patient decision aids. It's important to note that PDAs are not a new concept. There's been a push for PDAs into practice for at least the past decade based on consistent evidence demonstrating their clinical value. Other surgical specialties that have adopted PDAs in clinical practice with success include cardiac and orthopedic surgery. A large and growing body of evidence strongly supports that shared decision-making and the use of PDAs improve patient knowledge about risks and benefits and decision concordance with patient values. Shared decision-making and the use of PDAs also reduce decisional conflict specifically related to feeling uninformed and indecision about values. Notably, an updated Cochrane review in 2017 cited more than 100 randomized controlled trials comparing patient decision aids to usual care involving more than 30,000 participants across 50 different healthcare decisions, including about surgery, medication treatments, and screening and genetic tests. 
findings were consistent that, quote, when people use decision aids, they improve their knowledge of the options and feel better informed and more clear about what matters most to them. Shared decision making and PDAs work. There are published standards for ensuring the quality of PDAs. These standards for screening, certifying, and evaluating the quality of PDAs are published by two institutions. The first of these published standards was in 2006 by the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration, or IPDAS. Based on the work of IPDAS, the National Quality Forum subsequently defined two sets of criteria for patient decision aids, screening and certification. The seven items listed on the left are the screening criteria. These are the minimum requirements for a patient decision aid. This criteria is what makes a patient decision aid a patient decision aid, as opposed to some other type of patient education material. A PDA is only eligible to be considered for certification if it meets this minimum set of screening criteria. The second set of criteria contains additional items that the PDA must meet to be certified indicating the PDA is of high quality and with lower risk of making a biased decision. These are the 12 items listed on the right. Note that while the National Quality Forum has published these national standards and the need for such a national independent certifying body was specifically identified in a provision of the 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, no funding was appropriated and a sustainable model for funding has yet to be identified. Because of this, the National Quality Forum is not actively certifying PDAs. Washington State, however, began certifying PDAs through a state-based initiative in 2016. Also of note is Washington State's informed consent law is a shared decision-making standard, where the use of a PDA certified by the Washington State Healthcare Authority constitutes prima facie evidence of informed consent. The intent here is to further encourage adoption of shared decision making and patient decision aids in practice with incentives such as this increased liability protection. The National Quality Forum screening and certifying criteria we just reviewed are based on the work of the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration, or IPDAS, as previously mentioned. The original 74 item IPDAS checklist linked here is an excellent evidence-based tool for evaluating the quality of PDAs as it helps to clarify the minimum screening and certifying criteria by providing a bit more specification for each item. The primary breast augmentation PDA we are reviewing today was developed based on these published standards. So preliminary evaluation of the PDA included reviewing it against this IPDAS checklist. To consider, this is an example of an appropriate use of a checklist. The A to, Z, A to Z inventory of decision aids is a searchable, publicly available online database for patient decision aids made available by the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Developers of patient decision aids can submit PDAs to be included in this database only if the PDA meets the definition of a patient decision aid, reports the date of last update, provides references to the scientific evidence used, and be publicly available. After submission, the PDA is reviewed for quality based on the IPDAS criteria. Our primary breast augmentation PDA was submitted and approved for inclusion in the A to Z inventory. All PDAs listed in the inventory include a summary of the PDA and details on how much of the IPDAS criteria the PDA meets. The PDA summary listed in the A to Z inventory is linked here for the primary breast augmentation PDA. These slides will be made publicly available uh, with the recording of this webinar as links to further reference materials are also included throughout the presentation if of interest to anyone. Before moving on to reviewing some of the key features of our PDA entitled Making Quality Decisions About Primary Breast Augmentation Surgery, I'd like to check back in to see if there are any questions from the audience or if Dr. Haas or Dr. Cassis have any comments they would like to add for discussion. I want to share the results of our survey, and it seems that approximately 52% of us are using ASPS consents, 30% plastic surgery specific, 12% their surgery center, and only 6% are using patient decision aids at this point. Over half of those responding had never heard of a patient decision aid or don't really understand it. 
And while 21% of those who responded said it's a part of their practice, still only 6% said they actually use the patient decision aid. So I think there's some people here are gonna be pretty interested in what we need to say. That's great. And do we have any questions from anybody at this point? I know people are hoping to kind of get updated on patient education. There were some questions about the current FDA recommendations, which the new FDA recommendations are for industry, but many of those recommendations are kind of addressed with the PDA. Specifically, the FDA wants us to use, wants industry to use checklists. As you're gonna find out here, patient decision aids do have a checklist, but they have much more than that. A checklist on in and of itself is passive informed consent. We need active informed consent. Absolutely. Laurie, do you have anything to add? I don't think she does. All right, shall we proceed? I think we shall proceed. Great. To start with an overview of the format and how the PDA is structured, this PDA is designed intentionally as a preferred alternative to traditional informed consent documents for primary implant-based breast augmentation surgery, as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. The PDA is procedure and population specific. Defining both the procedure and target audience is necessary to ensure the right patient gets the right information. Here, the defined population is based on the approved FDA indication for the use of saline or silicone breast implants for cosmetic augmentation. It's worth noting that upon downloading, downloading the PDA, it might initially seem pretty long or like a lot of material. However, the PDA is divided into five distinct sections, each guided by an overarching question corresponding to a specific decision point along the natural decisional timeline when a patient is considering and making decisions about primary breast augmentation surgery. For example, the first section reviews, how should I prepare for decision making? Each section makes explicit the relevant decision or decisions necessary for patients to consider the essential information needed to make a decision and details about why the information is needed or how it should specifically inform their decision making. Values clarification activities are included throughout to assist patients in identifying and communicating their goals and preferences to their plastic surgeon. The entire PDA is color coded for ease of identification of the relevant decision. What I think is most important about how the PDA is structured is that it follows adult learner theory by orienting information to the context of the decision at hand so the newly learned information can be immediately applied as opposed to the content-oriented traditional informed consent document that parrots long lists of risks, et cetera, with no guidance for how the information should be applied or how it is relevant to the patient's actual decision-making, as we reviewed at the beginning of this presentation. Dividing information into meaningful chunks is also a useful strategy for tackling information overload, which has been previously identified as a concern for this population. We know from looking at the psychology literature that if new information is not applied, we will forget most of it after just six days. Results of a crowdsourcing study informing the, this, the development of this PDA of nearly 400 adult females actively considering primary breast augmentation surgery showed that most respondents have thought about breast augmentation surgery for more than one year, suggesting that patients passively consider primary breast augmentation surgery for at least a similar time frame. Importantly, this is a lot of time to absorb information, whether the information is true or untrue, complete or incomplete. Further, a patient may know a lot or feel like they know a lot about the surgery, but may still not know the essential information necessary to meaningfully participate in quality decision-making and informed consent processes. So by structuring this patient decision aid, 
as context oriented, we can help make sure that patients understand and appreciate the information that matters during the time they are actively considering their options and actually making decisions, thus ensuring the right patient gets the right information at the right time. Here's the first page of the PDA. You will notice that there are annotations on the side in various colors. Those colors correspond to where the information came from, why the information is in the PDA, or why the formatting of the PDA is the way it is. These annotations help to highlight some of the key features of the PDA, including examples of how the published standards were applied from the National Quality Forum and IFDAS screening, certifying, and quality criteria, and the relevant research also informing the development of the PDA. For example, the who should use this decision aid block in the center of the, this first page of the PDA is annotated in teal text that it identifies the target user. This is a specific item in the National Quality Forum screening criteria. So as we go through the patient decision aid, there's going to be a legend at the top right corner of each slide, color coding the annotations to specify where the, inf where the information item came from. For example, annotations in teal correspond to the National Quality Forum screening criteria. The blue annotations are sourced from our expert consensus survey study of active members of the Aesthetic Society using a modified Delphi method. The purpose of this expert consensus study was to guide what specific information should be included or excluded from the patient decision aid by defining a core essential information set for any cosmetic procedure generally and primary, primary breast augmentation surgery with implants specifically. These core information sets serve as guidance for what is minimally necessary for informed decision-making for all patients actively considering primary breast augmentation surgery with implants, but do not preclude further disclosure or discussion of additional information as relevant to the individual patient or surgeon. The purple annotations are sourced from our crowdsourcing survey study of nearly 400 adult females actively considering primary breast augmentation surgery. This study was conducted after the expert consensus study to define the scope or level of detail needed for the core information sets defined in the expert consensus study to actually be informative to the patient decision-making and informed consent process. The preferred timing, format, and presentation of information was also informed by this crowdsourcing study. These two studies, along with the published standards for PDAs, make up the evidence-based approach used to develop this patient decision aid. This approach engaged both patients and plastic surgeons in the development of the PDA with the goal of increasing the likelihood that it will be adopted and useful in practice. Keep in mind that there may be surgeon-specific techniques or patient-specific risks that are not covered in this PDA, but again, it does not prevent the surgeon or patient from having these further specific discussions. The PDA cannot cover everything that may be relevant or important to each individual patient or surgeon. Rather, the PDA and the studies that produced its content were designed to definitively establish an acceptable minimum standard for disclosure necessary for all patients in this defined clinical context. This helps to limit the ethical quandary of hyperinforming patients of every possible risk. Returning to the first page of the PDA, the purpose of this first page is to orient to who the P PDA is intended for and why and how it should be used. As mentioned, each section of the PDA is designed so it can be used independently of the other sections to best support the patient based on their stage of decision making. For example, sections such as the how should I prepare for decision making may be most useful for patients to review before consultation to help them to prepare for decision making. The section what questions should I ask my plastic surgeon may be most useful during the consultation and informed consent process to facilitate shared decision making. And the last section, what are my next steps may be most useful for patients after consultation. Remember that supporting informed consent and patient education materials should work for you, not against you. As mentioned, this first section, how should I prepare for decision making on page two of the PDA is dedicated to supporting patients preparation for decision making. 
Preparing patients for decision making is incredibly important, but is also commonly overlooked. Further, we know that most patients considering aesthetic plastic surgery look online for information before ever presenting for consult. I think this quote nicely summarizes the rationale for this section. Patients who have access to high quality evidence and health information and who also possess e-health literacy skills to make sense of it can most meaningfully engage in shared decision making about their care. On page three of the PDA, the top section, is plastic surgery right for me, is a distinct section because the information presented is common to all aesthetic plastic surgeries rather than procedure specific to primary breast augmentation surgery. The bottom section of this page and the top section of the following page, which is page four of the PDA, are focused to assist patients in clarifying and communicating their goals and preferences to their plastic surgeon. This is important because there's no true reference standard or accepted common language for patients and surgeons to communicate about what patients want and what their expectations are. For example, a number of respondents stated in the crowdsourcing study that they wanted to change or improve the shape of their breasts. So this was included pictorially here to help facilitate mutual understanding of what exactly a changed or improved shape actually means to both the patient and plastic surgeon. As noted in Teal, this is also an example of a values clarification activity corresponding to one of the items in the National Quality Forum screening criteria. On page five of the PDA, I want to highlight the bottom left annotation on the need to clearly differentiate between complications and expectations, as this was a general theme elucidated from free text comments during the expert consensus study of active members of the aesthetic society. For example, the risk of cosmetic dissatisfaction following surgery as a complication is differentiated here from the expectation that satisfaction with results may change over time which is not a complication of surgery. The importance of differentiating complications from expectations is further seen in that traditional informed consent documents and patient education materials often blur this distinction. Page six and seven of the PDA review the implant style decisions and compares the options and their features. Here, I just wanna highlight the rationale for the inclusion of the why is this important descriptions. Adult learner theory further follows that in addition to needing to immediately apply newly learned information, adult learners also need to know why the information matters. So to account for this, a description about why the information is important or how it should specifically inform the patient's decision making is explicitly included each time new information is presented. On page seven, I want to point out the section that mentions a key benefit. The true benefit is based on what the patient is trying to achieve and which option will best help the patient to achieve it, which needs to be guided by the plastic surgeon during consult. This really presented a challenge to balancing the presentation of risks and benefits in this PDA. So to account for this, I reiterate prompts for what to discuss with your plastic surgeon related to the decision at hand. Page eight of this PDA reviews surgical approach decisions. The first, incision location, and the second, placement plane. The reason only two incision location options are presented here for direct comparison is because the IMF and periareolar incisions were the only two options that were deemed essential for all patients considering primary breast augmentation by those who responded to the expert consensus surveys sent out in 2019 to active members of the Aesthetic Society. The second point I want to highlight here is why these two decisions have accompanying photos. For information about incision location and implant placement plane, more than 60% of respondents in the crowdsourcing study prefer this information to be presented as photos. Page nine of the PDA includes a check your knowledge quiz. This knowledge quiz is a simple exercise for patients to help ensure patients and plastic surgeons start on the same page based on the patient's existing background knowledge about primary breast augmentation surgery. Put another way, it can help to focus consultations on what patients need to know rather than what they already know. 
The specific questions included in this quiz were based on the essential information items for informed consent and primary breast augmentation surgery defined in the expert consensus study and focused based on one, the questions most commonly answered incorrectly in the crowdsourcing study, and two, insights gleaned from the presentations and testimony of patients and patient advocates during the FDA advisory committee meeting in March of 2019 on information they felt they were not informed of before undergoing surgery, but believe all women considering the surgery should know. This worksheet included on page 10 of the PDA is formatted to help guide the conversation between patients and plastic surgeons during consultation. It includes frequently asked questions with each question prompt, including the relevant key considerations and essential risks for patients to consider and select what matters most to their personal decision-making process. The questions are color-coded to the relevant section of the PDA for easy reference to additional information as needed during consultation. Importantly, a key feature of this consultation guide that I wanna highlight is the link to an icon array tool corresponding to the last question on the worksheet, how likely are complications. Evidence strongly suggests that how risks are communicated influences decision-making. Specifically, how risks are communicated or presented to patients affects their perception of risk ultimately influencing the quality of the patient's decision-making process and how informed their consent is to surgery. Best practice for risk communication includes using numbers, not just words, and employing the use of simple percentages or natural frequencies, i.e. rates with a common denominator, as it improves the accuracy and patient perception of risk. Further, providing a graphic representation, such as using an icon array, which is shown here, increases the comprehensibility of numeric information. Using only words such as low risk, uncommon, or rare is not effective, but unfortunately common practice of traditional informed consent documents. However, we chose not to explicitly include quantitative complication rates in this patient decision aid for the following reasons. One, the lack of clinically meaningful comparable risk data due to differing methods of data collection and reporting for breast implants and thus no common denominator. And two, the common themes gleaned from free text comments in the expert consensus study of the overwhelming negative plastic surgeon per perception and mistrust of breast implant complication data and that complication rates are surgeon specific, alluding to concerns in the quality and utility of available risk data. These insights about the scientific uncertainty of available risk data were applied to the PDA by including this link to the icon array tool to help facilitate a discussion about the risks that matter most to patients using surgeon specific complication rates. This last section of the patient decision aid includes two validated scales, the SURE test and the effective decision subscale of the traditional decisional conflict scale. I think it's important to take just a couple of minutes here to review the concept of decisional conflict because reliably recognizing and addressing decisional conflict during decision making really is critical to the success of any informed consent process. Decisional conflict is defined as, quote, a state of uncertainty about a course of action. Empirical evidence has demonstrated, quote, that for every unit increase in the decisional conflict scale, patients were 19% more likely to blame their doctor for bad outcomes. Additionally, decisional conflict was an independent predictor of blame. Most importantly, decisional conflict is a modifiable construct that, quote, can be lowered with decision supporting interventions such as PDAs. On this page is the SURE test, which is the shorter screening version of the traditional decisional conflict scale intended for use in everyday clinical practice. It screens if the patient feels informed and clear about their values, i.e. which risks and benefits matter most to them, if the patient feels that they have enough support for decision-making, and lastly, if the patient is sure about which option is best for them. This is specifically relevant because the SURE screening test can, quote, indicate the probability that the patient experiences clinically significant decisional conflict. The SURE test is scored by simply applying a value of one to each item marked yes and a value of zero to each item marked no and calculate some total that can range from zero, which would signify extremely high decisional conflict to four signifying no decisional conflict. 
a score equal to or less than three indicates decisional conflict. It is recommended to administer the full 16 item decisional conflict scale in the context of a positive shore screening test. However, I feel a more practical approach is to review the suggested activities listed below the SURE test on page 11 of the PDA based on the patient's specific area of uncertainty and then repeating the SURE test or if desired the full decisional conflict scale once the patient's decisional need has been identified and addressed. On this page is the second validated scale, the effective decision subscale of the traditional decisional conflict scale. Effective decision subscale items are given a score value of zero for strongly agree to four for strongly disagree, summed, divided by four, and multiplied by 25. So scores range from zero, indicating a good decision, to 100, indicating a bad decision. Most importantly here is that the use of these validated scales applies an evidence-based approach to confirming patient readiness to make a decision and the validity of informed consent keeping in mind that decision-making and informed consent processes should be evidence-based, not arbitrary. Reported at the end of this PDA on pages 13 through 18 is the technical information about the PDA and its development, including the date of last update and update policy, the credentials of the developer and reviewers, funding and disclosures, and references to the sources of evidence used. Inclusion of this technical information is a key characteristic of high quality PDAs. Lastly, I'd like to once again remind and encourage the audience to download the PDA if you have not done so already. It can be found at the web address noted on the slide, uh, which is also linked in the registration materials for this webinar and Sue placed it at the top of the chat. Thank you again to all for the opportunity to share this presentation with you this evening. I truly appreciate your time and your interest in this work, and I look forward to any questions, comments, or feedback anyone may have. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Chelsea. Uh, it's amazing what you produced um, with our help of our amazing uh, group, but you've done most of the work. We met Chelsea at the FDA meeting and we really understood the value that you would have and the impact you would have for our patients. I can tell you from my early experience, I've queried over 40 patients that exist in my practice, breast augmentation patients who've come in for follow-up or I've done virtual consults um, in follow-up. I've sent them the PDA and uniformly their comments are the same. Thoroughly educational, very easy to read, so much like the consult that they had with me, but they didn't have anything to bring home. So they feel like this is going to have so much added value for my future patients because it's all consolidated, you know, in uh, a few pages, basically. I've, I've queried over 50 new patients. We send the PDA to them um, before their appointment. They come in with the PDA with questions written on the PDA. And their comments are very, very similar, except they call it an educational journey. They feel it's very comprehensive. They feel like it has all the important information that they needed. Um, they really feel like this is the way to educate on this particular topic. So I can tell you from the experience I've had over the last six months, that for me, this has you know, just saved me so much time because I would basically go through all this information, but I didn't have it formatted like this in a color-coded format that was interesting for patients to read. So I'm very excited about this launch, and I hope um, all of you, if you have any questions, please ask any of us. Thanks. Thanks, Laurie. So important. Um, a couple of things. Number one, I, I do want to thank the Informed Consent Task Force, which was not just Bill, Laurie, and I. It was Caroline Glixman, Pat McGuire, Kai Higdon, uh, Clark Sherla, Brad Calabrese, and a couple others around the country who've helped review this. But again, as Laurie said, Chelsea did the heavy lifting on this. And to answer Mark Jewell's first question, what have we spent on this? It's kind of embarrassing, Mark, but we haven't really spent anything. I think Sue Dykema can clarify that we paid a 
small fee for help with certification, but this was Chelsea's doctoral project. And she agreed to give this to us for free as long as we provided it for free to any plastic surgeon, board certified plastic surgeon or board eligible plastic surgeon who wanted to use it. In regards to the beta testing, we wanna roll this out now, but, it, but part of that beta testing is we want to do two more webinars coming up, one of which is gonna to be to staff to help educate them on how to roll this out to patients. And then the third webinar, again, all thanks to Allergan, is gonna be to help reach patients because our goal is that this can get diff diffused throughout the internet world so that patients can use this, especially the first few pages, to get educated with information we want them to have versus just information from random, random sites. Um, and yeah. Yeah, next has question. A question. You handle that one, Laura. <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, what I'm doing is when uh, patients call for a consultation and schedule one, then we send the PDA to them. And so they have that ahead of time. When they get to the office, we ask them if they brought it with them. If they have not, then we give them another copy. Um, my staff has zero burden. It's 100% um, on the relationship that I'm developing with the patient when they come in. So I, what this has done for me is it shortened my consultation because the patients have already been educated before coming to the office. does help with cut down on that amount of time you spend diffusing the disinformation that people come in with. And I think Chelsea touched on, and she may want to address for you, Dr. Wu asked about, is this legal consent? And indeed it is. And I think she pointed out Washington State, just the use of a PDA is prima facie evidence of informed consent has been obtained because it is shared decision making. Now, uh, we're working on getting this one certified, or rather, Chelsea is, and that will vary from state to state. So the question, to answer that question, uh, first, I, the cost for this PDA, the only costs that were spent were for SurveyMonkey and uh, the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform for the crowdsourcing survey, so a little bit of research dollars, um, but other than that, um, no further costs. Um, and then as far as the legal aspect, um, Washington State is certifying PDAs, but they are not, it has to be certified by the Washington State Healthcare Authority to have their technical stamp of approval. Um, and of course, encouraging malpractice carriers to take a look at this. Um, I know I have... Um, peer decision-making colleague who is working in that area that may uh, have a better answer. And I can certainly follow up with respect to that. Um, I hope that answers your question. The, uh, yeah, I think that's great. Thank you, Chelsea, so much. I think um, someone has asked about how are choices regarding implant manufacturers truly informed and discussed with the patient? I think that this probably is a little, because all manufacturers are listed on the PDA, as well as textured versus smooth, as well as silicone versus saline, at least the patient can is now going to sign off that they've seen the different manufacturers and the different types of implants available in the US. I mean, none of us can control what each one of us does to steer a patient towards one manufacturer or the next, but this actually shows that they they know that they do exist. I would agree with that. And uh, making the information available here, it's on page six of the PDAs where the manufacturers are listed. And then there's uh, further information that's specifically right underneath it talking about why is this information important. And so it talks about how different implants have different risks and that they vary across manufacturers. So at least it's a discussion prompt with the plastic surgeon um, to help kind of reconcile that. But 
since uh, can't really compare directly across manufacturers with the currently available data, um, this was the best way that we could think of to approach that. But of course, as that evolves, the patient decision aid can evolve, evolve as well. I think Dr. Adams has kind of pointed out, you know, the Aesthetic Society has been first and foremost about education of our members and by extension, patient safety. And I think many of us in our office have our own version of informed consent and how we educate patient and, and try to get to a position of mutual understanding. But this is actually a proven way that you can document that you've gotten there. And as a mother of a dyslexic child, I know better than anybody that not everybody learns the same way. And not everybody's a verbal learner. Not everybody's a visual learner. And some people just initially in boxes are not going to be enough. This kind of takes all that into consideration. And it should be a living, breathing document. And hopefully at one point we'll be able to even add video. Do we have other questions? Yeah, I think Christine there's one you, had a Laura. question. Yeah, Christine had a question. So what I what we do is we when we send them the PDA uh, in an email, we say please read through it. Um, most of my patients that I uh, eventually see always come in with questions already. So now they're writing the questions right on the PDA. So I don't go through the PDA page by page because I've sort of created a, a consultation methodology that is part. It, it really covers everything on the PDA in the sense of, first, are you a good candidate? Two, what are your expectations? Three, um, uh, anatomical examination of their body. Then uh, four, implant selection process. So I'm doing all that as I've always done. It's just that this provides them with an information sheet, you know, multiple sheets to take home with them. And then they write notes. Uh, today, somebody, you know, wanted a copy of what I actually was thinking in terms of which implant, exact implant, uh, so that they add that to this document. And I think, Laurie, you said that, like you had a patient, you said it isn't that this was anything different from what you and no. I discussed before no. my surgery, but now I can take it home with me. And it's Correct. in the order that we discussed it. And again, it goes to that, how much do patients remember? I do want to, I've forgotten to give a shout out to our past president, Grant Stevens, who actually helped us find Chelsea. We wouldn't have known her or met her or met her at the FDA without him. So thanks, Grant. And I want to second that. Uh, Dr. Stevens served on my project committee for my doctoral research, and he was immensely helpful in guiding my project. And uh, he actually chose that the first procedure we should focus on is, is breast augmentation. So he was right on point with that. Dr. Cassis, there is a question about the, you know, the amount of time or time burden with patients and staff using this document. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? I, I thought I did, but I will again. Um, there's been no added time burden. In fact, the consultations are uh, about 20% faster because patients are coming in more educated, better educated. My staff does not get involved with patient education when it has to do with breast augmentation. Thank you. You know, the other thing I think it's important to notice is the recent FDA labeling guidance documents that came out included a patient checklist because that was what they felt like at the meeting would help with informed consent. Their checklist in that labeling guidance document is 14 pages as opposed to the five pages of informed consent documentation in the PDA. But the PDA includes more than that. It's the pre-consult education if, if we decide to use the example that the FDA has sent out for manufacturers as manufacturing labeling guidance, there's a whole lot more in there and it's going to, I think, take up a whole lot more time. This should be more concise with better education and touching on all those things, but in a way that, that us as plastic surgeons are used to doing it versus just going through a checklist. Any other questions from anyone? We thank you so much for coming out. 
We are going to set up a staff education webinar, as I said, coming up, thanks to Allergan. And then we'll follow that, hopefully, with a patient education webinar. And Dr. Haas, we do have a, a poll for the end here. Oh, yeah, the poll, our other poll. We've got just enough time for that. <laughs> Roll out the poll, everyone. Please stay and finish the poll before we let you get back to your families. Okay. Um... It's going to make me share the results of the previous poll first. So yeah, that's okay. We can do that. I'll share those. That's okay. So everyone can see that from earlier. And then let me see if I can get the second poll out and launch this. If everyone can respond to this, that would be most helpful. And, and Christine, Christine uh, uh, you can get the Chelsea's contact information from uh, Sue. So there were a couple questions that I think we didn't quite touch on that maybe we can while everyone's taking this poll is once the form is filled out by the patient and added it to the consult time, when do they finish the reform the form and return it with signatures? Is that at the end of your consult, Dr. Cassis? No, I have, if they decide to schedule surgery, they come back for a pre-op visit and that's when that happens. Great. Otherwise it's, you know, just education that they get to take home with them. So, and, and hopefully it sets me apart, right? That's the key that we provide a gold standard of education and outcomes. And then the last question is, what pages do you recommend to send to the patients before the consult and then afterwards, or do you send it all as one document? I've sent it all as one document. Great. Thank you. I think we're done with our polling. We can share the results. Let's of do. How exciting. Oh, Chelsea, you got a gold star. Look at that. Fantastic. The goal is for this to be useful, and so it's always good to know. Excellent. All right. Well, keep your eyes open. We'll send you links to the video um, once this is uh, available on the website. So the video link as well as another link to the PDF. And we'll be in touch very soon with uh, when we can do a staff training webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, Sam.